everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I'm Jody Grinwald. This week, my guest is Fran Hauser. Fran is the best selling author of The Myth of the Nice Girl Achieving a Career You Love Without Becoming a Person You Hate. Her second book, Embrace the Work, Love Your Career, is quickly becoming the go-to for women seeking more joy and fulfillment in their career. Fran is also an investor and has invested in over 30 female-founded companies. Her current work is informed by 15 years spent in media, where she rose through the ranks at Time, Inc. to president of digital. Are you interested in writing a book but are unsure how to get started? Fran shares her journey and some steps to take to get your book off the ground. We also talk about gratitude, respect, and some of the best ways to effectively communicate with those on your team and those you want in your sphere of influence. Please subscribe to the Today's the Day Changemakers YouTube channel. Download the podcast from most streaming sites. Don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Today is the Day Live It. Also, to learn more about Today is the Day's overall programming, international annual forum, the upcoming Changemakers Connective, business coaching and consulting, go to todayisthedayliveit.com. The views expressed by all Today's the Day Changemakers podcast guests are their own. Their appearance on the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast does not imply any endorsement of them or any entity that they represent. Thank you and have a fabulous week, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I am Jody Grinwald, and as I say every single week, I get to interview the changemakers, the inspirers, and those who are disrupting the status quo in the best way possible. And today, I have Fran Hauser with me. Hi, Fran. How are you? Hi, Jody. I'm great. How are you? I am great. I'm just really so happy to have you here. I got to hear you speak at a United Way of Northern New Jersey event and with um, Kieran Gordioso. And I'm just, just loved what you shared and ran up to you and said, here's my card. Can we do this <laughs> for the yes, podcast? I'm so glad we made it happen. Me too. Me too. So we're going to get into a conversation, but as I always start, I'd like to read a little bit about your bio and then we're going to go from there. So Fran is passionate about leveling the playing field for women. She does this through her investing, writing, and speaking. Fran has invested in over 30 female-founded companies across consumer tech, CPG, media and publishing, and wellness. She is the best-selling author of The Myth of the Nice Girl, Achieving a Career You Love Without Becoming a Person You Hate, which I, I can't wait to talk about this, which has been translated into six languages and was named Best Business Book of the Year 2018 by Audible. Fran's new book, Embrace the Work, Love Your Career, is quickly becoming the go-to for women seeking more joy and fulfillment in their career. Fran regularly speaks at conferences and organizations to help women build careers they love while staying true to themselves. Much of her current work is informed by 15 years spent in media where she rose through the ranks at Time, Inc. to president of digital. She lives outside of New York City with her husband and two sons. Mm -hmm. So Fran, this is so exciting because there's so much in there that I want to cover. I don't think we have enough time, but we're going to get to a lot of it. Sounds let's great. start let's, let's start at the beginning right I always like to learn a little bit more about you you know when you were younger so where did you grow up so I grew up actually in um, Westchester County which is you know right outside of New York City about an hour north and my parents were born and raised in Italy I was actually born in Italy um yeah I didn't I don't think you you knew that about me Jody mm-hmm. so So we moved um, to the United States when I was two. And, you know, my parents both had small businesses. My dad was a a landscaper and a stonemason. My mom was a tailor. I spent a lot of just helping them. I was their translator. You know, I, I did the invoices for my dad's business when I was in first grade. I was helping my mom, you know, create like a marketing logo. Like, so... I, I got involved um, in business at a really young age and, and carried a lot of responsibility because I'm the oldest of four. So like a lot of it fell on me. Wow, that's incredible. So I'm from New York myself. So that's, we have that in common. And my grandmother was a tailor and my father came from Italy. So what part of Italy where are you from? So Reggio Calabria, which is like, you know, the tip of the boot, like across from Sicily, you know, so all the way down South. Um, so yeah, so that that's and but farming community. Okay, farming okay. community yeah. really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, so I always, I always say I just feel so blessed because, like, when I think about my parents and how much 
courage, you know, it must have taken, right? I mean, it's it's the immigrant story, right? But like to leave a country where you know how to speak the language, you know how the culture works, you know, you just, and and to just kind of uproot your family and just start from scratch, you know, it's it's just so amazing. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is that so many of their cousins, their, all of their siblings, they all moved around the same time and they mm. all moved to the same town um, wow. in Westchester County, a town uh, called Mount Kisco. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of them are still there and now their kids and their grandkids. So it's just this really beautiful, you know, it, Italian community that I'm still blessed to be a part of because I just live in the next town over. Oh, wow. That's, inc that's amazing. And the thing about, think about the tenacity, the courage and everything it took, right? And it, it kind of, we'll get to this, but it kind of goes with what it takes as a female to rise through the ranks to, and, and also to help other females rise through the ranks and, and the work that you're doing to help make that happen. So I, I want to get to that, but Growing up, it sounds like you were ready, like first grade, you're doing invoices and marketing. And so you're already on track. But did you always know that this was the where you were going to wind up? Did you have like a thought process of what did, what you wanted to be when you grew up? Yeah, it's I definitely had a feeling that I would end up in business somehow because that's what I did. I mean, like I, I got exposed to the fundamentals of business, you know, like at a really young age, whether it's you know, their cash comes in, cash goes out. You want more cash coming in than, you know, cash that goes out. Um, even just seeing my parents interacting with their customers, with their clients, um, watching them handle really difficult situations. Like, so just being exposed to, to all of that, I kind of had an inkling that that is what I would end up doing. I really loved business. Um, and, you know, and, and that is what I ended up doing, right? If you look at my career, whether it's building businesses, running businesses. Now I'm an investor in startups. Um, business has just been a really big part of my life. The other thing I would say though, about when I was younger is that my passion was reading. You know, I loved to read. Like I was that kid that was like in my room, sitting on the floor, back up against my bed, you know, just engrossed in a really good book. And um so real passion, real passion for reading. And the one thing that felt so beyond reach for me was the idea of being an author. Like, it's just not something that I ever thought um, I would have the opportunity to do. So the fact that I've now written two books, like it's just so rewarding, like and the impact that those books have made. Um, so, so it's kind of cool that like, yes, I'm a business person, and that's something that I started doing when I was very young, but I'm also an author, you know, and that, that was my passion, my true mm -hmm. passion. So you bring that up and that's, that's really something that's close to me because I've been writing this book, right. For a while now. And, and I think there's a lot of people that feel like there's things, it may not even be about becoming an author. It's about, you know, you, like you said, it's, it's that thing that you, you want to happen, but you're not sure how you're going to make it happen. What advice do you have? You know, somebody's listening right now. They're like, I want to be an author too, or I've got this vision of what I want to do. And I don't know how to get there. Fran's got more tenacity than me. She knows more than me. What advice do you have for that person? So a few things, you know, the, the first thing I would say is don't be afraid to just start writing, you know, just start. And it could even be a blog post or it could be on social media. But if you have an idea for a book, especially if it's a nonfiction book, I really encourage people to just put the content out there and see, like, does it land? Does it resonate? I did a blog post um, for Forbes years ago now on nice girls finishing first. And that blog post ended up becoming one of the most popular blog posts in their mentoring series. And I started hearing from women all around the world, really saying that they had read the blog post and that this was a real pain point for them, that they felt like if they were too nice at work, they were thought of as a pushover. And if they were too strong, they were thought of as a bitch. And they really didn't know. Like, so because I, so that blog post basically validated my book idea. And so when I went out to talk to agents, to talk to publishers, 
the fact that I could say like, look, I put this out in the world and it, it really resonated and it landed. There's really a pain point here that I'm addressing. This is a, a big idea for a book. So don't be afraid to just start writing, you know, even in shorter, shorter form. Um, lock time out to write. Like for me, I have to do it first thing in the morning. You know, even when I was writing my second book, I'd get up at 5.30. I'd get up way before my kids do because I knew like I needed that time to be creative, like to be in that space to, to write. Um, and then the other thing I would say is find people who have have either published a book themselves or they're in the book publishing world in some way. Maybe it's even a bookstore owner, you know, but, right. but network your way to somebody who can be helpful to you. There's also lots of programs that you can sign up for. There's a lot of online courses on, you know, how to write a proposal for a nonfiction book, you know, or fiction, if you're interested in, in doing fiction. So I, so that's what I would say, like, right, just start, write, put stuff out there, see what kind of feedback you get, and then find those people, you know, who can be helpful to you. The one thing I have to say, like, Jody, when you use the word tenacity, like, because my parents were immigrants, I was the first in my family to go to college. My parents didn't have a network that could be helpful to me right? So I had to figure it out. I had to completely figure it out. I had nobody who could be helpful to me in my network, literally, mm -hmm. right? So, yep. so you get scrappy, you're curious, you like even now, like the fact that like you can go on LinkedIn, you know, and find people and find like, okay, who can make a warm introduction to this person for me, right? So that, yep. that's part of the process is finding the right people who can be helpful. I agree. And LinkedIn has been so wonderful because Ugo Balta, who I didn't know from anywhere, and he is the um, owner of Latino News Network. And I reached out to him because I loved what he was doing. And he answered me. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's incredible if you come from a service space, what you can, instead of trying to sell some, that's the one thing about LinkedIn. We've got, if, if I can just do a little public service announcement, stop trying to sell on LinkedIn and use it as connections yes. uh, for sure. Yes. But I want to go back. I want to go back to a couple of things. One question is, is how long did it take you to write your first book? So, okay. So I came up with the idea back in 2009. The book didn't get published until 2018. Okay. So that I'm just tenacity, nine years, <laughs> right? That book was nine years in the making because you come up with the idea, then life gets in the way. You know, we, we adopted our first son in uh, 2010, then 2011, our second son came along. So like, right. So like life gets in the way and all of that, but it finally, it finally happened. You know, once I got the book publishing deal, it took about six months to actually write the book, you know, and get it to the place where it was a complete and final like manuscript. Um, it took about six months and it was like very, a very intense six months, you know, it was like chapter by chapter, sending it into the editor, they're editing, they're redlining, they're sending back. Um, but yeah, but like it's sticking with it. Whereas my second book, I came up with the idea in the middle of the pandemic and I knew I wanted to get that book out quickly. I wanted to get it out in a year. Um, and I was able to do that. I was able to find a publisher quickly. I wrote the book in six weeks. Wow. And, yep, in six weeks, I wrote that book. Um, went through like the design and layout process, but we got that book out in a year. But also because it was my second book, I felt like I kind of knew what I was doing. Like I knew the team that I had to like cobble together to make it happen. You know what I mean? Like, it's just different. The first time you do something, it's brand new. So there's a big learning curve, right? Um, so yeah, so it's 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 interesting to see how different the, the two books were in terms of the time to market. Oh, absolutely. Nine years, one year. Huge difference. Nine years, that's, one year. That's Literally, incredible. Years, one, like one year from concept, I came up with the idea to publish versus Myth of the Nice Girl, nine years. Right. And, and like there, that learning curve, right. You were able to shorten it on the second time around and you knew what you wanted. And 
I think also, and I'm, I'm not speaking for you, but some of that fear also, you know, you get, when you're through something the first time, it's a, it's, it helps so much. Confident, right? You're more confident. I had the network. For my first book, I had to build the network. I had to find mm-hmm. those people. For my second book, I had the network, you know? And so it's, it's, and I had the confidence. And that is, that's a huge part of it. Like the fact that I was able to write the book in six weeks, it's because I really did have the confidence. Like with my first book, it took us so long to get through the first chapter because my editor felt that I wasn't being vulnerable enough. I wasn't sharing the stories where, you know, there were more learning moments where I messed up, you know, where I failed. It was hard for me. It was really, really hard for me to do that. I felt much more comfortable Mm -hmm. talking about other women's stories and sharing their successes and sharing research and stats. But I had a really hard time, like just opening up and sharing my failures. And once I was able to do that, it just made the book so much better, you know? So like we got through, once we got chapter one done and I was like, okay, I get it. Like the book really needs to be relatable. Like women, when they're reading this book, they need to be able to see themselves in my stories. So I had to get comfortable sharing those stories. And that, that took me a little bit of time. No, that, and I think, you know, that's something on the podcast that I constantly say is that if we could all bring down our judgment, right, and really lessen because we judge every day so much, then we can share more vulnerability and, and, and help lift people up. And that's, that's our biggest thing is judgment is such a learned behavior. Um, you know, it's not something we're totally born, born with. We, yeah. we, our judgment is shaped by our families and the people that we surround ourselves with. And so, and then it gets, then it even exacerbates when we get into our own careers and, and that's why people get held down. And, and that goes with, you know, your first book, the myth of the nice girl, achieving a career you love without becoming a person you hate. Let's talk about that for a minute, right? Because we, as women, we are taught, you said it before, if you're too, if you're too nice or a pushover, and if you're too aggressive, right, then you're a bitch. So how do you, you know, how have you found, and when you're going out and speaking, can you share a little bit about how do we continue to stay in that nice place without going to either side of the spectrum? Yeah, well, I think a big part of it is believing that you don't have to choose between being nice and being strong. You know, it's a, it's a false choice. And for me, you know, I've always led with both of those qualities. I've really cared about my team and I've also had very high expectations of them, right? So it's like, you can care about people, but also like hold them to a high standard. That's the, t- the tough part, you know? I've, um, you know, when I communicate to people, you know, communicating in a way that's both kind and direct, right? Again, it's like, you, you, can, you can do both. Um, when you're making a decision, you know, yeah, let people in hear their opinions, hear their thoughts. But at the end of the day, like you have to make the call and really, you know, believe in in the decision that you're making and have the confidence to make it. And so all of these things kind of live side by side, right? And it's like just really believing that, okay, I can be both. I can be nice and I can also be strong. Like you can be powerful without being a jerk, right? Like, right. That's, I, I have to tell you, like out of all the con- digital content that I've ever created, I wrote an article for LinkedIn when The Myth of the Nice Girl came out that was basically, the title was something like that. Like you, you don't have to be a jerk to be powerful. And it's still my most widely read um, piece of, of content, you know, d- mm-hmm. digitally. I think it really struck a chord with people. So I think just really having that that mindset is important. I think also like, if you're as a human being, you know, if you operate with empathy and kindness and compassion, don't check those qualities at the door when you go to work, you know, because those are qualities that can really serve you well. That Those are the qualities that allow you to build relationships, to connect with people. And, you know, I believe that being in success, being successful in business at the end of the day is all about relationships. It's about your relationships, Right. Like whether you're looking to get resources allocated to your department and you have to like influence the person who's running that department, right? Um, 
or if it's negotiating. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's all about relationships. So those qualities serve you well. Uh, absolutely. I, I'm a big believer in servant leadership. That's something that I feel very strongly about. And I know that not everybody understands that or is like that, but you do get a lot more when it's the we instead of the me and the team is together. Um, and, and as a leader, you're part of the team, but you're right. You have to make the final decisions and they're not always the popular decisions. Right. But it's also the way that you communicate it, right? It's like, it's just, you know, expressing gratitude for everyone's thoughts. Like, I really appreciate it. I really took everything to heart. I, re- you know, I really considered everything that all of you said. And look, at the end of the day, I think I, I need to make a decision so that we don't lose momentum so that we can, you know, move forward. Here's what, you know, I believe we should do. This is what we're going to do, right? So the I, I feel like the communication part is so important, right? It's the way that you communicate it um, so that it's, it's, it's from a place of appreciation and gratitude and thoughtfulness and respect. I really respect your opinions, right? All of yeah. that. Um, and, and it's just more palatable for people if you communicate it that way. You know? Let's talk a little bit about Embrace the Work, Love Your Career. Tell us about, about what made you write this book and a little bit about it. Yeah, so so this book really came to me during the middle of the pandemic. And, you know, I had a moment where I was reading all of the articles about the millions of women that had left the workforce Mm -hmm. and the millions more that were questioning their career path and trying to figure out like how to reconnect with their work, you know, really going through an existential crisis. And it was just kind of in that moment where um, I realized, you know, I really want to put something out into the world that can be helpful to these women, you know, and I, I decided that I wanted to create more of a guided workbook as opposed to a 60,000 word narrative, which is what most career advice books are. The myth of the nice girl, right? Is narrative. This book, I'll show it. Yes, please. I love it. Um, It's, it's really, it's beautiful. You know, it's four color, Um, There are little meditations and coloring breaks at the Mm. end of each section. It has a very kind of holistic approach, you know, lots of questions and writing prompts. So, you know, lots of opportunities for women to kind of take a step back and really reflect on, you know, what's energizing them, what's draining them in their career. What do they want to do more of? What do they want to do less of? Um, So the workbook concept, I think just it, it, it really works because it's allowing women to um, really become the authors of their career. Mm-hmm. You know, like they they can really kind of take a step back and do do the work, do the actual work, um, do the reflecting. Because I feel like so often we're in this autopilot mode where we're just kind of yes. plowing through. We're just plowing through our jobs. We're plowing through our careers. So the book is really an opportunity for for women to just take a step back and, and do the reflection, um, and really truly create a career that they love. So it's, this is the book, Jody, that literally we got it done in a year. It was so important to me to get it out quickly because of the crisis that, Mm -hmm. you know, that we are in. Um, so it's like, I had to get it out quickly. Um, and it's, it's really resonated with women. I'm just, I'm hearing, so much terrific feedback and some surprising feedback, you know, like what I've heard from a lot of women is that they went into the process Mm -hmm. of going through the book, thinking that they were going to completely change industries or do something, you know, completely different from what they're doing today. And instead they were able to find ways to reconnect with their current role and their current company, which I thought was so great, you know, so, so great. Like one, and one of the exercises that I think helps you do this that I have in the book is I encourage women to look at their calendar for their, for the last two to three months and find those meetings, those events, those experiences that put a smile on their face. And then really like reflect on what was it about the experience that was so fulfilling? You know, was it the type of problem that you were solving? Was it the skills that you were using? Was it um, the people that you were working with? Um, and then figure out a way to do more of that. Because if that's the work that, that's bringing you joy, how can you bring more of that into your current role? Um, so that's an exercise that I'm getting a lot of really fantastic feedback on. 
It's funny when you just said that, I also thought of the flip of that too, is that where have I been putting my time that is not fulfilling? 1000%. Yes. There's a whole section in the book on how do you create time and space so that you can work on the things that are rewarding, that are fulfilling, that bring you joy, that make an impact, that create value for the organization that you're working for. Like, how do you create time and space? One of the ways that you do that is literally by deciding, like, what should you put on a to-don't list? We all have our to-do lists, right? But what Mm -hmm. are those things that you're just for now, maybe for the next month, for the next three months, or maybe for forever, you can decide you're just going to kind of move them over to a to-don't list. And it's so clarifying. It's so wonderful to just get those things out of your brain. Know that they're on a list that you can come back to whenever you want. They're going to be there waiting for you, right? Right. But the fact that you have that clarity. So when I was writing Embrace the Work, Love Your Career, I knew I had six weeks to write it. So one of the things that I put on my to-don't list was I decided during that six-week period, I was not going to take pitch meetings with founders, mm-hmm. right? Because my day, I'm a startup investor. So I have founders reaching out all the time asking me, can I look at their pitch deck? Can I meet with them to give them feedback to potentially invest in their businesses? I made that decision that for six weeks, I was not going to take any of those meetings. So it was so wonderful, Jody. Like whenever I got, you know, a request in my inbox, I could just very easily say, look, I'm heads down working on writing this book. I've decided to not take pitch pitch meetings for the next six weeks. And that way it's not personal. It's just, I have strategically made this decision. So it's a really easy no. And think about like how much time and space I created for, for myself during those six weeks, right? So having that to don't list is just as important as having the to-do list. You know, you mentioned something that I think a lot of people, and I don't want to just say women, but I will say that because I am a woman, but um, the word no is very difficult in, in some times because we are, there's an expectation out there that we're going to get everything done. We're going to answer everybody in 24 to 48 hours and 48 hours is pushing it and all of that. And How do you suggest for those listening, um, how do you get more comfortable with the word no? You were able to do that in the space you were in, but to do that on a daily basis, what are are your thoughts around that? Yeah, well, so I actually, I did a little survey um, for this book, for my second book, because I wanted to understand why we have such a hard time saying no. And what I learned was that it's really complicated. Like there are lots of, there's 15 different reasons came back Mm -hmm. from people pleasing to FOMO, to mm-hmm. maybe being a little bit of a control freak and just kind of wanting to do everything yourself, um, martyr syndrome, like there's, I mean, so many reasons. The reason I bring this up is because it's really important to know what your why is. Like I can tell you for me, it's always been people pleasing. I've always been that person ever me since too. I was a child, right? And so knowing that is half the battle because when I get a request, whether it's my inbox or someone asks me to do something, my knee jerk reaction is always to say yes. So before I say yes, I have to check in with myself and literally ask myself, are you just saying yes because you feel bad saying no? Are you saying yes because you feel bad saying no? Or are you saying yes, because this is something that's aligned with your priorities? Or maybe it's just something that's going to bring you joy and you want to do it, which is also a great reason, right? But just being very intentional before you respond is so important. Like really, like I can't tell you how many emails I have where I'm about to say yes. And then I'm like, no, this... Or let me sit on this for a while. I don't I don't need to respond right now, right? I can respond tomorrow after I have some time to think about it. Mm-hmm. Because our time and energy, I mean, those are our most precious resources. So being really intentional before you say yes. The other, um, the other thing that I would say is if you are going to say no, you can keep it really short and sweet. 
It doesn't have to be two or three paragraphs explaining why you're saying no, right? Because I feel like the more information you give, then you're giving the other person an in to negotiate with you. So you're giving them so much information. So right. it's just a couple of lines. It's like, thank you for thinking of me. I'm heads down working on writing my book, whatever it is you're working on. Um, so I won't be able to participate at this time, but I wish you the best. It's two lines. Right. That's it. Really simple. Right. Yeah. So, um, cause I, I do feel like we all have this, like not all, but many of us, um, have this tendency of over explaining. And by the way, that takes time too. That's like another 20 minutes to write that email. No need. That and the I'm sorry's. I have been writing I'm sorry and erasing it, like deleting it. Me too. Me too. So years ago, I realized that I, I had a real like problem with this. Um, I typed the word sorry into my, into the search box, um, the search fields in my inbox and like hundreds of emails came back. The reason I did that was because a friend of mine called me out on it. She said, do you realize like you, you apologize a lot for things that you don't really need to be apologizing for? And I honestly didn't believe her. So I'm like, I'm going to check my inbox. And when I saw these hundreds of emails and I went back and I reread the things that I was apologizing for, it was like, oh, so sorry. It's taken me so long to get back to you. When it was literally like I got back to the person the, the next day, like, what am I apologizing for? So I downloaded this, um, this Google Chrome extension called Just Not Sorry, which alerts you every time, every time you type the word sorry, it was created by a female engineer, this amazing woman. And I actually talked to her the other day. She said it's been downloaded now over half a million times because she, this was something she was doing. She was always saying, I'm sorry. So she created this extension, this Chrome extension. Um, and I used that extension for a good year. Cause it would just, it just alerts you. Like, do you really want to say sorry? And it was a way to like wean myself off of it, but yeah, check for that and replace it with thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for thinking of me. Right. So it's such like yeah. a, just a much more positive way to start an email as opposed to, I'm so sorry, I can't make it. Or I'm so, right. you know, it's just, it's so that's a big one. Do you know, Jody? that was the most popular story from my first book, The Myth of the Nice Girl? It was my, that story that I shared about um, how it was something that I struggled with and how how I addressed it. It ended up being the first ex, the first book um, excerpt that was chosen. So Oprah.com, that was the story that they chose to run. Um, and it was hands down, like if you look at the Kindle version of the book, it's the most highlighted version. So I think it's, it's something that a lot of us struggle with, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Like other speech weakeners, just being really aware and just being really aware of it. And, and what I've heard, uh, you know, and I don't know how true it is, but what I've heard, it's very much female dominated. I'm <clears throat> sorry, dominated. It's, you don't find a lot of uh, men saying I'm so, you know, I'm so, you know, they've, they're very much to the point. I'm not, I hate generalizing. So, uh, you know, I do too. I'm just I saying do this too. is what I've heard. I hear you. Yes. And I've heard that too. And there's been research, you, you know, there's mm -hmm. been research that's been done that also um, proves that out. And I think just in my own experience, it's, it's what I've seen as well. You know, yeah, there absolutely. are definitely these behaviors um, that hold us back as women. That's one of them for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Pam 10 is a leader in IT enterprise solutions and staffing. They are driven to transform their clients' business performances. They do this every day by providing their clients with the best services and products. Products like BizLego, an online community platform, and Colier, a unique learning management system. They also transform the lives of women and children through their associated nonprofits, SheTech, which supports women in and joining the technology field, and Softkin, support organization for kids in need. Pam 10 technology for social good. Go to pam10.com for more information. Before we move on, because I want to talk a little bit more about your career trajectory in way of what you're doing with your investing now and where you started, just let everybody know where they can find your books. That's really important. Yes. So they're, they're available everywhere that books are sold, which is great. They're, you know, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, they're in bookstores. 
Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty much everywhere still, which is amazing. That's great. And it's social media wise, where is there anywhere to find them? Social media, I'm at Fran underscore Hauser on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm also on LinkedIn. Awesome. Okay, great. I'm glad. I always like to put that in, in the middle here. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that. No problem. And, and I think it's really important that, you know, uh, for people who are listening to go and take a look, right? Look, look at what, what Fran's talking about, because what we all at, at some point or another, you know, are in a place where we, we need personal growth, you know, and, and this is what you're, you're doing. You're helping women, men, personal growth. I mean, obviously this is centered around women, but anybody can learn. Anybody can learn from what you're sharing. I, I have to tell you, I've heard from so many men who have gotten a lot out of both books. You know, The Myth of the Nice Girl, like th- there's a lot in there that is is applicable to men as well. And same thing with Embrace the Work, Love, love Your Career. Um, so if, the, if either of these topics is something that speaks to you, go for it, please. You know? Well, if you're, um, if you're a man and, and you're in a management or a leadership position, you should be reading these books because yep. you probably have women that work for you. So yes, this is how you learn. So true. It's so true. Right. So, so let's talk about now you, you have in, in here that you worked at um, Time Inc. in digital and, but that probably wasn't, your, what was your first job? Do you remember that? Just to go back oh for a gosh. second. My first job was in public accounting. It was a price waterhouse. Really? That's a yeah. great first job. I started out in accounting and um, which of course, because I was doing my dad's invoices when I was seven. So like, what else? you know, it was like practical and, but I have to tell you, um, I think about this a lot. I'm so glad that I started out in accounting because it gave me such a strong financial kind of just foundation, you know, like And I think it just gives me so much credibility. Like even over the years when I was at, when I was working in media, when I was at Time Inc, I was running the digital division. The fact that I really, um, like I wasn't just the creative person, you know, I was also like putting financial models together and understanding, you know, financial models and sensitivity analysis and assumptions. And um, so it's just, it's, it's, it's something that served me really well, even though like what I'm doing now, it's so different, right? From where I started my career, I've pivoted probably five times in my career, but mm-hmm. having that, that kind of accounting is just, you know, it's, it's, it's business fundamentals, right? Yeah, yes. so, right. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about what working for Time Inc. as president of digital meant. I loved that job. You know, I I loved working at Time Inc. I was there for 10 years. It was the world's largest magazine publisher when I was there. And, and, you know, I was there during a really interesting time where um, digital media was really taking off. And I was really working on that, like for these legacy brands, like People Magazine, you know, launching people.com and, you know, Mm -hmm. like when the iPhone came out and, and the iPad came out, like, what, what does the magazine look like on these devices, right? So it's like the digital manifestation of, of the content was really what I worked on and, and really building businesses around that. Um, so it was, it was so much fun because I felt like it was very much an entrepreneurial role. You know, I was starting these products and businesses from scratch, but within this huge organization, Um, so I had the resources, right. I had the money, I had the people Mm -hmm. and all of that, but I was like people.com. It was like me and a few other people that started working on that website. And then we grew it to over a hundred people that were working, um, just on that one website. So that's, I think what I really appreciated was the idea of like being able to build these products and businesses from scratch, but within an environment that really supported it, you know, and, um, so it was it was really an incredible experience. And as part of that, I a big part of my job was meeting the startup founders. You know, I, I got to meet with like the women that um, that launched Rent the Runway, you know, mm-hmm. pre-launch. Um, I was meeting with, you know, Foursquare and Flipboard. I mean, some of these companies aren't even around anymore. Um, but it was just it was so much fun. And it was so interesting to figure out, like, how do we partner with these startups? 
And then I also just really enjoyed being a sounding board for the founders, you know, and I, I realized that, you know, gosh, my kids were like three and 18 months. They were really little. Mm. And I, I started thinking about like, could I create a professional life for myself that was still enriching and, and rewarding, but also gave me more flexibility so that I could be, you know, with my family more. And that's when I decided to move into startup investing and advising and just kind of, you know, I launched a practice. I went to work for myself 10 years ago. I left Time Inc. and um, and decided to do that full time. And then I now have over 30 investments. I have, you know, over 30 companies in my portfolio. Um, the majority of them are female founded because only 2% of venture capital funding goes to female founders. So that's something that I've been, you know, really focused on. I really want to change the ratio there. Um, but I just, I, I love it. You know, I just, I really love this part of my career. And frankly, it gave me the time and the space to write these books. Like if I was still mm -hmm. in a C-suite mm -hmm. role, at, you know, at a big company, I just don't think I would have had the time and space to write The Myth of the Nice Girl or to write Embrace the Work, Love Your Career. Like I, so, so that's kind of what's been really great is that I'm now in a position where I can choose the projects that I work on, the businesses that I get involved with, the people that I work with. It's, it just, it feels, um, it just feels like such a blessing. It, re it really does. Hmm. Do you think there'll be a third book? I do. I do. And I'm, I'm really, um, I'm noodling it and I'm starting to socialize it with different publishers. Um, and it's a little bit of a departure from sort of career advice, business, women's leadership. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm hoping that it, that it'll happen. It's something that I'm just like really excited about. I know like when there's something in my head and I can't get it out of my head, it's something that, you know, does that happen to you where it's like, oh, yes, all this, right, where it's like, oh, my gosh, yes. I can't get this out of my head. So it's like, I'm just really hoping that um, I'm manifesting it. I hope, hopefully it'll it'll happen. The podcast, it was it was seven years ago that I thought of it. And I started it during the during COVID too, December of 2020. Um, so it took a while I'm manifesting it. Like, I'm all about manifestation am, and yeah. law of attraction. Totally. Don't you feel like as like as soon as you start talking to people about it and you start putting it out into the world, like it just it 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 does it. It ends up happening. It has legs. There's something about it that just gives it legs and it gives it validity. And then when you see other people, like when I started talking about the podcast and asking people, would you want to be a guest? What are your thoughts about creating a change makers movement, not just a podcast? Yeah. Uh, people got excited. And the more they got excited, I got excited. Yep. And then it's like, because you're socializing it, you know, you're now building your pipeline of guests, you know, it's like, so I, I'm the same. It's like, you want to get, even with the myth of the nice girl, there were so many young women that I had mentored over the years. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to them and I said, you know, I'd love for you to be a part of this journey with me. And I'd love for you to help me get the book out into the world. You know, is that something that you'd be interested in? And it was, yes, yes, yes. And I actually created a nice girl army and it was just, it was a Google group. It's like 150 women. And I did that before the book even came out, like the six right. months leading up to the book's release. Um, you know, because I, I knew that I, I wanted to have these, like these ambassadors, you know, like these women that could really vouch for me as somebody who was a mentor to them. Cause I was basically taking, the in real life mentoring that I was doing and I was packaging it up in a book, right. Just to like be able to scale that advice. Um, so right. I love that. I love that you did that. I love that you just started kind of socializing and planting the seed. And in doing that, you, you built your own kind of army, right. It's kind of, yeah, it's so absolutely. Cool. And, and, you know, we call it a movement because, you know, change makers uniting around the world, to make a difference in their corner and beyond, I thought was just something and coming from a service. It's not just like, what are we all going to be able to expand in, in our work, but as individuals, that was very important to me. Yeah. Um, love it. You know, love so they, aw, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is why I get to meet such incredible people like yourself. So, um, 
you know, for those listening real quick, I just, because I think that anybody who hears you're an investor and they hear that, you know, I don't want you to get bombarded with a bunch of different uh, emails and things like that, but is so for those listening, is there something that you're focused on that if they, somebody's going to contact you, this would be the reason. So is there something that you look for when you're investing that you can share? Yeah. So the sectors that I'm like really interested in right now are consumer. So like, you know, I don't, I don't really focus on enterprise. So it's really consumer products. Um, and I'm very focused on consumer products that are good for our collective well-being. Um, and I think that's really something that's come out of COVID for me. You know, it's just something on a personal level that I feel really passionately about. Um, and those are the products that I want to see out in the world. Um, so that those are the sectors. I come in very early. You know, I come in usually like the first round of funding or maybe the second round um, where a founder might be raising a few hundred thousand dollars, right, to get to get the product off the ground. Or maybe they've launched the product um, and now it's really about, you know, raising money so that they can market, do some marketing around the product. Um, so I think th those are all kind of things that I look for. And then obviously there are sort of character traits and personal attributes. And, you know, I, I really pay attention to how I feel after I leave a first meeting with a founder, you know, do I feel like I want to spend more time with them? You know, am I, am I kind of sad that the meeting is over? Like this is somebody who, you know, we're values aligned. Um, I feel like energized when I'm with them, like the conversation's really interesting. I feel like they're interested in my feedback. I can't tell you how many times I've met with founders who have been so dismissive. Like they, it's like they're, they're, they're very clear on what they want to build and they don't really want to take feedback in from anyone, you know, and it's kind of like a digging your heels in that for me is, is a bit of a turnoff because I just feel like to be a successful entrepreneur, um, it's really important that that you're adaptable, that you're flexible, that you're a good listener, and that you don't have a mindset of, you know, knowing it all and having it all figured out. So all of those things are things that I consider when I'm deciding, you know, if I'm if I'm going to invest or not. You know, you said something that's really important, and and I I'm the same as you. I go from my feeling right. And, and even when I choose podcast guests, right, they just, I've had people come to me, I've had, I've had publicists come to me and want people put, you know, their, their clients on, but then I'll go and I'll look them up and, and I'll read some quotes that they've said. And that feeling comes up that I don't think they're the right, the right fit. You need to follow that intuition. A lot of I people agree. don't realize that. I agree because when I first started investing, I didn't have the confidence, right? You, you, you build confidence over time. And I made some bad decisions. And because I'll tell you, like I made two decisions that were not the best decisions. And I remember with both of those founders, I left the meeting with a little bit of an icky feeling. And I invested anyway, solely based on the fact that they had these like A-list investors that had already invested. So, so I was like, well, what do I know? I'm a new investor, right? What do I know? There's these incredible people that are putting their money into this. And I was, it was almost like a starstruck kind of thing. I'm like, oh, if they're investing, then I'm going to invest. And, you know, both of those businesses ended up imploding. And a, and a lot of it was because of the founders and because of their character issues and integrity issues. And um, so, right, you do these things and you learn. and and that was like a, an incredible learning moment for me, which was if I had gone with my gut, if I had gone with how I felt, right, then I, I wouldn't have made those investments. So, you know, failure and learning and all of it. It's just, it's so important. Yeah, I, I you know, Brene Brown is, is someone that I, I do a lot of reading to, uh, and she talks about not failing, but falling. And I feel like, you know, we fall as kids, and I say this on other podcasts, when we, when we're babies or toddlers, we fall, we get back up, scrape knee, put a bandaid, move on. And so I'm really on this mission with, because when we say failure, it sounds like it's forever, it, yes. right? When, yes, yes. It's got this. But like, we permanent. fall. 
Yes, but we fall and we get back up. Exactly. Right? We fall. And you do incredible work. Yeah, I love I it. I love tell it. You how many times, like, because you know, when you're in that moment, when like something doesn't go as planned, you know, when you, you, um, I don't, when you just don't get the outcome that, that you want to get, it's so hard. You know, it's so hard when you're in that moment. And I feel like for me, the quicker that I can kind of like get through it and be like, okay, it happened. I can't change what happened, right? The only thing that I can control is how I respond to it and how I present myself to the team, you know, and, and am I going to be a, a good role model for them, right? Am I going to set an example? And I think that that's a big part of it. It's like we fall and we, we get back up and we learn. Like, so what did we learn from this? right, that we can use going forward um, to help us make better decisions. Exactly, exactly. I, I had a glitch in a podcast for the first time in two years yesterday when I launched it. And and I you feel terrible, right? Because you need to get it out on time and it was late and all that. Like in the grand scheme of life. It's small. That's what we need to remember. I literally, I was having a, a, a conversation with um, another mom um, who's a, a friend of mine and her son is really struggling, um, in school and cause he, he just transferred to a new school. And she said, she's like, look, I know that this is small in the grand scheme of things. And like, that's the way that I need to approach it. Like it's hard right now. I love, um, when Glennon Doyle says we can do hard things. I feel like I've been saying that phrase a lot mm -hmm. lately, like to my kids, to my friends, to, I mean, I just, I feel like the whole world is just a little bit off kilter. And I have so many people in my life that are going through really hard things. And mm -hmm. I, that's like, it's like, we can do it. We, we, we can get through it. Acknowledging that it's hard, right? Not just like okay. sweeping it under the rug and hoping that it goes away. It's hard and, but we're, we're going to get through it. Right. And finding those who are in your corner. That's yeah. the other thing. And then, because there's always the negative Nellies. And I'm learning to not, not to push them out of my life, but to put them on the outskirts, right? Because if they're in the middle, while you're in a good space, you're going with them. So it's finding the balance and surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals, which is a gift. Yes. Yes. I agree. And I, I yeah. And I, I do feel like, again, coming out of the pandemic, um, I think we're all being more just thoughtful about our relationships, right? And who's in our life and who isn't. I wrote a list. I still have it on my bulletin board. Um, when we were in lockdown, I made a list of the people that I missed the most. Mm -hmm. And I made a commitment to myself that once we got out of lockdown, that I was really going to make an effort to see these people, to be with them to you know make sure that I stay connected with them um, and to prioritize them, like to really prioritize them. And you know, it wasn't a very long list. I really wanted to keep it like manageable, you know. Um, and it's it's still there. And you know, I think we just gosh, we we grew so much during the the yeah. pandemic, right? It was again so, so hard, but that's one of the things Absolutely. that came out of it for me is just this like real focus on who really matters to me and who do I really like when I'm not with them, I really miss them. And I, I want to be with them. I want to spend time with them. I love that. I love, and you know, there's a dopamine rush, right? When you're in, yeah. in someone's space, you know, when you were at the United Way event, there was 500 people in that room. And, and it was just that feeling when you were talking and people were shaking their head and you're all on the journey together. And that was a miss. You can, you can get a little bit of that from Zoom, but it's still not the same thing about being in somebody's space. Yeah, I agree. I totally, totally agree. Yes. And yes. And prioritizing that, you know, we, I have a great group of um, female angel investors. We all do like a, a lot of, you know, co-investing together. Um, and we've really like started doing these in-person gatherings again, and they're just so special. So, so special. Like just bringing women together. We talk about what deals we're looking at, what we're excited about, you know, do any of our portfolio companies need help? Um, you know, are they looking for a certain type of talent or advisors or, you know, board members? 
How can we help each other? How can we support each other? How can we support our portfolio companies? And doing that in person in a beautiful space, there's there's nothing like that. There isn't. There isn't. Yeah. And Fran, I could talk to you for hours. I know. And not just what an hour. How has it been an hour? Oh. I know. It it flew it flew by and I totally could talk to you more but what my, my goal is to is to say is hopefully you'll be a part of the change makers conference yes. and also have you come back as more things happen you know with you because you you're obviously on this incredible mission to share and make a difference and be in service which is incredible oh i would love to i'm in and thank so you i'm so gonna let, ask you the last but yeah. Oh, no, no problem. I'm going to ask you the last question I ask every guest this year. I change the question each year. This year, it is, what is the footprint you're creating right now that you want to leave behind? I would say that, you know, it's for people to feel like they can be their true selves at work and still be successful. You know, I, it, for me, it really comes back to authenticity and like feeling that connection with yourself, you know, feeling like the decisions that you're making, um, your behaviors, the way that you're showing up for people, that all of that is just really aligned with who you are as a human being, you know, really aligned with your, with your values. So that's, that's really what I'm um, focusing on and, and wishing for. That's beautiful. You know, we talked about at the last change makers conference about leaving your a game of armor behind and bringing your a game of authenticity. Authenticity is one of my favorite words. Yes, me too. I love it. Me too. Me too. I, again, I want to thank you, Fran. Thank you for sharing again, last time, just tell everybody where they can find you. Yep. So Instagram, um, at Fran underscore Hauser. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and also my website, franhauser.com. Awesome. Awesome. So we'll have you back soon, I'm sure. And again, thank you so much for being a guest on Today's the Day Changemakers. And I'm going to say what I say at the end of every single podcast. Today is the day. You cannot go back to yesterday and you do not yet own tomorrow. So what small or large step are you taking today to get yourself closer to your goals? Have a great week, everyone. Bye, Fran. Bye, Jody.